Good afternoon. I am Christy Oliver, the Professional Development Manager at Davis Publications. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon for our um, next weekly webinar. They will happen on Tuesday afternoons through mid-June. Today, we are thrilled to have Bette Naughton, author of Adaptive Art, Deconstructing Disability in the Art Classroom with us to explore the various ways we can modify our approach to help all students have success in the art room. A few quick housekeeping things uh, before we get started. We would love for you to ask questions throughout our time together. The best way to do that is to type your questions into the chat box or use the Q&A button. Both can be found at the bottom of your screen. We'll be monitoring these throughout the session and we'll get to as many questions as we can during our time together. Also, just a reminder that we are recording the session and after we finish today, a link to the video will be emailed to you and will be available for viewing at davisart.com slash free resources for anyone who might like to watch. I'd love to introduce our speaker today. We have the next slide. Uh, Bet Naughton calls upon her years of experience and field research working with students of all abilities to create adaptive and engaging lessons for children of all abilities. Bet looks at a student with special needs, what they can do rather than what they cannot do, and creates adaptations to engage the students in a meaningful artistic exploration built on their strengths. Her passion regarding this topic has enabled her to remove many of the obstacles students with disabilities encounter during the process of creating and responding to art. Her primary research has been in understanding how students' conditions, syndromes, and diagnosis affect them so that teaching strategies can be adapted to provide successful endeavors for all learners. As an artist herself, Bet understands the power of art as, a, as an avenue for self-expression and communication. For students with disabilities, art is often a crucial path to communication. Bet has presented her hands-on adaptive art lecture series in many conferences and educational institutions, including as the keynote speaker at the Moore College of Art on numerous Pennsylvania Art Education Association presentations at Kutztown University and was recognized at the PAEA Outstanding Special Needs Art Educator. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to turn it over to Bet Naughton. Next slide. Hello, thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm thrilled to meet you all. So a little bit of the session overview, I'm Bet Naughton, and um, I've been working with students with special needs for over 20 years now. Uh, we're gonna be talking about your philosophical framework, fine motor adaptations, gross motor adaptations, sensory adaptations, emotional behavior, adaptations for hearing impaired and visually impaired, and also intellectual deficits. So. Um, in these pictures you can see where they're doing a Day of the Dead project, um, I always try to do the same lesson for my able-bodied peers, and then I adapt it for my special needs students, giving them the scaffolding they need to be successful in their art making. Next slide, please. So what's the philosophical framework? Um, that's kind of what you've collected over all your years of teaching, you go along and you see things that you like and you add them to your collection or your basket full of goods and you come up with different ideas and lessons and how you feel about things. So that's really what your philosophical framework is. So we're talking about why would we adapt art? Students communicate through art. For some students, it's the absolute only way that they can communicate. It removes obstacles and barriers that lead to student success. Working through one's ability is rewarding. So we're always looking at what the student's ability is rather than looking at the disability. It allows for self-expression in art and enables you to access a variety of learning styles. It's very important in this day and age that we support the IEP goals and align with any IEP modifications and that we support specially in designed instruction. Next slide, please. So how do you adapt art? So you have to try modifying or adapting the following. You can adapt lessons. Perhaps you create lessons for your class on still lifes and you would have to adapt that lesson and scaffold it 
possibly even scaffold it back a little bit for your students with special needs. You have to change your expectations. You might feel that everyone should be able to do everything and that's just not the case. Even in a regular classroom with no life skills students in it, there are still students who are going through emotional problems, who have behavior problems, who have ADHD, and you just have to change your expectation a little bit that not everyone can do everything and not everyone has to do everything the same way. Adapting your tools and your mediums gives students a much easier access to um, being able to complete the lessons and the assignments and they are more accessible to creating art. Adapting your instruction and the way you teach and also your perceptions about art making and what the finished product has to look like. Next slide, please. So the first area we're gonna talk about is gross motor adaptations. And you need to develop the gross motors um, first because they support the fine motors. So anytime you can get students creating on a vertical surface, whether you're taping a big piece of paper to a bulletin board or a door and allowing them to paint on that, it starts building up what we call trunk stability in the body and working those gross motors. Anytime they can use their whole arm to paint as opposed to just using their you know, the fine motors of their hand is also building up their gross motors. So I recommend drawing on things like vertical surfaces, um, painting, uh, even I have kids that uh, have gross motor deficits and I have them just erase the chalk, the uh, whiteboard for me or the chalkboard when it was chalkboards, um, drawing on the, go up and have them to practice warming up. I'll say, go, go draw a couple things up on the whiteboard so that you know, I get them warmed up. Using long handled brushes also promotes more of the whole body. When you work on a floor, they have to use their arms to support them sometimes and that's getting those gross motors engaged. Um, doing wall presses, sometimes students uh, with emotional behavior problems need to kind of decompress. So sometimes I'll have them wear a compression vest. If not, I'll have them doing some even pushing their hands together or I'll put my hands on their shoulders and give a, a deep, kind of a deep press into their back or I'll have them carry something heavy for me. Using clay is a great way to develop gross motors, hole punchers and rolling pins. Uh, give them movement breaks. They can't sit still that long and don't you know break up things and just give them little tasks at a time. You have to adapt grips for lack of hand control. Some students can hold a paintbrush and other ones have what we would call a featherweight grasp where they just barely, even when they're holding the paintbrush, not much is showing up on the paper. So there are um, actually gloves that are weighted gloves that help give them some extra support to their hand. And use the body to create art with, use the hands, the feet, have fun with it, um, get some kinesthetic movement going. Could you show the video please? We're going to be showing little video clips of me demonstrating technique. I'm Bette Naughton with a few adaptations for gross motor skills. To build up the skills in the hand and the large muscles of the body, I often use uh, these big hole punchers, which are great because they really take a lot of pressing. They also give the student um, a shape, so if they don't have the ability to draw stars independently, they can use a puncher to create their shapes and a pattern for their art making. So these are great to be using. They can be used with the hand or to develop the uh, inside part of the hand that can be used with the pinchers like so. Using hole punchers are also great. They require a little bit more pressure and skill, um, but they're great to develop the arm and the hand as well. Scissors are another important tool we must look at. Um, we have everything from uh, maximum assist, so this can just help the student guide their hand by pressing down. They're spring-loaded. This is another spring-loaded option, which is easier when we don't have a lot of uh, hand strength. Allows you just to squeeze those, or a paraprofessional can squeeze the back part while the child hurt holds the front part and uh, learns how to use the scissors. A smaller one that works the inside of the hand muscles. And then you also have the ones with the extra loop on them to uh, force correct finger position. When it comes to drawing materials, uh, sometimes I'll use these crayons, which 
uh, a lot of students have what we call a tripod grasp or a doorknob hold and they want to uh, grab a crayon this way. Alternatively, they can also be used by putting them on the fingers to develop some muscle tone that way. There are many different uh, out in the market, so I suggest that you try a few of them to see which works best for your students. Some grow on very creamy, almost like an oil pastel, and others uh, automatically sharpen and roll up so that they have an easier time using those. When it comes to painting, a lot of times students with gross motor skills don't have the eye-hand coordination to hit the blue every time they're trying to hit the blue. So sometimes I will do this where I put a, a piece of paper across to isolate one color. It also helps students with cognitive deficits. Or maybe I'll use something like this from the replacement paints so that they can isolate and get just into the one color. On the topic of painting, uh, there's many different brushes and adaptations to brushes. So this is just a simple wide brush that has a chunk of um, modeling clay around it and you can use it that way. Or uh, you can use a clothespin and a sponge. This is an egg handle shaped brush which helps uh, force the hold. Here's another adaptation just using a cork in the end of a paintbrush. Or you can even just put a styrofoam ball on a brush to help uh, students have something bigger to hold on than the handle of a regular paintbrush. A shaving cream brush is also another great adaptation. And if that is still too uh, hard for a child to use, they can also roll paint on. I keep a bin of uh, pattern rollers uh, for students who can't uh, draw their own background or their own stripes in the background. They could roll one on by dipping this into paint. Other adaptations for gross motor skills I like to use is a clothesline at the back of the room to clip artwork on um, as the glue dries so that if it's hanging in the room, students have to use their pinchers to develop uh, and hang artwork, or they have to reach up above their head, which builds trunk stability to add as they hang the artwork. So as I adapt, I uh, showed you some tools. These are adaptations to actual lessons. And doing a lesson off of uh, the famous artist who use hearts a lot in their artwork. It would be hard for a student with cognitive deficits and some gross motor skills to draw a heart on their own. So there's two ways you can do it. You can give them a heart to trace if they can't make one independently. But sometimes if they just paint that and then paint the background, they'll actually paint over their heart that they already did um, as they're trying to paint. So a good way to prevent that is to actually give them, say, both parts as you cut out a tracer and give them this to put down first and they paint to contain that. As you can see, some paint gets on here and then when they go to do the background, you put down the counter image here so that they can paint around it without getting it on their image. Uh, whenever I'm working with students with gross motor deficits, sometimes I'll give them a tracer if they can't draw independently and I'll also let them work a little larger scale than their able-bodied peers. So you can give a tracer made out of oak tag or you can make a thicker one out of uh, foam or even heavy cardboard. If they can't create patterns independently, they can use pre-made patterns from paper or wallpaper or they can create them using texture plates, which is another great pressing activity to build up those gross motor muscles. Here's another uh, way to adapt a lesson, a simple still life. If they can't do the patterns, they could peel stickers and put them on, which is a great fine motor activity I'll teach you, or they can use pre-made patterns. Um, doing a lesson on fiber arts, uh, the able-bodied students might be able to uh, work with the fine thread here, but it might be a little more difficult for uh, students with special needs. So if I had this requirement where they had to do three different stitches, I would scaffold back the project and make it just one stitch for my students with special needs. The first thing I would do would be to create um, one with thicker uh, I believe it's warp thread on there and I would also use a thicker fabric or a yarn to weave with. If that was still too difficult I might color code them blue yellow blue yellow and give them something uh, a little bit thicker to weave with so that it's easier for them to actually go um, over and under with as they weave. 
Again, it's just about fiber arts. If uh, weaving is too hard for them to do, you could also just have them put uh, different textures of fiber down and fabrics down to create their artwork that way. Giving students choice is very important. So in a lesson about musical instruments in my classroom, if a student can't independently draw, then I let them have a variety of different tracers. Uh, or maybe they play the violin uh, in music and they want to do a violin, I would make a violin tracer for them. So instead of just saying, here is a guitar, trace it, if you give them a choice of what instrument they would like to play, their artwork becomes more meaningful. Thank you for watching. Okay, next slide, please. So fine motor adaptations are essential for everyday activities such as fastening clothes, drawing and painting, and doing um, a lot of fine motor tasks. Uh, one of the things you wanna do is cupping for palm development, and you'll see this in the next video, and use hole punchers and um, different pinching activities, small pieces of paper you can tear, little tiny hole punchers, peeling stickers using finger crayons and tiny crayons, uh, adapting brushes, lots of lacing and beading activities, and of course, weaving adaptations and printmaking stamps for patterns. Can you show the next video, please? The following are adaptations to increase fine motor skill development. Fine motor adaptations are meant to increase the fine motor skills that students use every day, whether they're picking up things, buttoning clothes, holding a pencil, and making things. Uh, one of the first things I do is teach students how to tear paper, and there's a right and wrong way of tearing paper. A lot of times you do them tear a piece of paper and tell them not to tear it up. They'll say, well, can I use scissors? But just encourage them that the tearing is a fun activity. So sometimes they'll just grab it and rip it like that, and that's not using any fine motor skills. What you want to teach is a pinch, pinch, pull method. So pulling it, pinch, pinch, pull, and tearing, using these pinchers, building up the pincher strength in the fingers and the hand. After that, I usually have them tear little mosaic pieces. Sometimes my students with special needs will just have fun just tearing piles of little colorful paper to use in the project. Here's a, an instance where uh, the, the story of a little girl who made a picture by leaving the circle blank and here they use little pieces of colorful paper to make a mosaic-like effect. Another torn paper technique could be using torn paper on the edges of it to create a landscape or a uh, seascape picture. Using stickers is another great activity for students who um, also have cognitive impairments. They can use these to make a background. So you see when you start to peel off a sticker, and these are a little harder than other ones, but you're using your pinchers to, to pull it off and place it. So you don't want uh, the paraprofessional just peeling them off and handing to the student. You actually want them peeling it off. If those are a little bit too thin for your student, if their fingers are a little uh, more clumsy, then I suggest you get like little thicker ones. These are made out of the little foam pieces, but they're still using their pinchers. Uh, so there's different thicknesses of foam stickers. If this is too hard to use, then maybe this big thick one would be easier for students to use and apply. So those are another great activity. Anytime you can use small pieces for an activity um, and get the children to actually make their hand into a little cup or hold a little cup, it's a great activity. Occupational therapists have told me that the thumb muscles are becoming overdeveloped and this part of the hand is not being developed enough and that's coming from texting and too much gaming. So we wanna build up the muscles in here and that can be done by either putting some in their hand and telling them they have to hold it and then they have to use their pinchers and take and put each one on glue drops to hold them in place. So you could use mosaic pieces for a little mosaic project. You could do that with something like sequins or buttons that they have to glue on um, or even beads. So I use beads for a lot of activities. 
uh, a simple activity that I sometimes put in the center for students to do. If I see a student finishes early and they have uh, some fine motor concerns, I might put this activity on the table. And it's just giving them a pipe cleaner and telling them to thread at least 10 or 15 beads onto the pipe cleaner. I usually put a limit because I got some kids that want to put a million beads on. And then you can turn that into a bracelet or you can make it a bookmark. But that's great eye hand coordination and also doing some fine motor work. If those beads are too small for your student, then you can also shop for some bigger beads. I like to give a long piece of yarn or a lanyard because then when they actually have to put the bead on, uh, they have to pull it all the way down to the end and that's crossing the midline of the body which builds trunk stability and increases gross motors. So we need to build gross motor development first and then fine motor. Another option for large beads would be using uh, some big wooden beads and stringing them together. When it comes to drawing uh, materials, I like to make my pencils a little bit shorter and sharpen them down or save my old ones uh, just for this activity because when the pencil is shorter, they're kind of forced to hold it the correct way using their pinchers. Same with crayons. If I give a student a full-size crayon, they can still hold it like this and draw or hold it like that and draw or we're trying to get them holding it this way. If you give them a broken crayon or a small crayon, then they can't grab it that way. They're kind of forced to hold it this way and do their coloring. So small crayons force. It's also good to um, have draw some little tiny areas for an exercise and have them actually try to work on just coloring small because when you're coloring small like this, you're actually really working the hand a lot as opposed to coloring bigger. Some kids will get there. It's the whole arm movement's happening where if you work small, you're really working on your fine motor skills. Lacing is another great uh, thing to practice. And whether you do it uh, as a project, like a little fish picture, if you need a tracer, the student can have a tracer, but you can make this into a fun little rainbow fish project. Uh, as long as you're encouraging students to use their eye-hand coordination and focus on taking it and then pulling it through. Shoelaces are another great way to do lacing. Or you could even give them a piece of the foam and hole punch it and lace that way as an activity. Or turn it into a lesson for your entire class where they have to do some lacing. It would be the same with the mosaic pieces. You could turn the lesson into a class project. If I was doing something like this on um, ancient Roman art, I would have them, if they made the papers themselves, some of the students painted the papers and then cut them up, I would have uh, cut them first with a paper cutter and long strips and then just have them do the little snips to make the squares or rectangles so that you don't want to fatigue the hand. I hope you've enjoyed these fine motor activities. So you can see how essential it is to use fine motor um, development in your class. And a lot of times people say, well, is it just for the students with special needs? And I never want to single any child out that way by making it just for them. So sometimes I'll put it on the whole table. I, I might have one or two students at that table because I adjusted the seating that way. But I'll put it the whole table and everyone's allowed to do it because a lot of students coming in to art from kindergarten don't have a uh, fine motor skill development at all. They are really not doing hardly any art projects in class anymore. Everything seems to take place in the art room. So that's why it's kind of our job to really be on the front grounds there and start developing these in all children at an early age and from kindergarten up. So don't worry about just giving it to one student. You can give it to the entire class. Uh, incorporate these activities. A lot of times students will see someone else using an adaptive brush or something and I'll just they'll say well can I try it and I'll say sure you, you know they can try it too so I don't ever try to single anyone out. Next slide please. So sensory adaptations um, are a really important thing to work on. I'm finding I'm having more students with sensory adaptations and sensory um, processing disorders come into my classroom. So sensory can have a positive or negative reaction. I'm sure some of you have had uh, been doing a unit on clay and have a child that just does not want to touch it at all. 
So being hypersensitive is when you get an uncomfortable reaction to the senses being engaged, whether it's touch or a smell or like really loud music. And I don't know whether your art room's anything like mine, but it gets a bit loud sometimes in my students with um, hypersensitivity concerns uh, actually need to wear headphones or they need kind of a quiet place or I'll let them go sit at a table. I have like kind of a graphic design area in my classroom and I'll just plug into one of the computers and iPad and give them some headphones so they can kind of tune everyone out as they work. Hyposensitive means that the senses need to be stimulated or engaged. So they would need something like really loud or they'd have to move around all the time or they might need like really spicy food. So uh, some students, I had one little girl who was a darling little girl, but never really wanted to do anything. And um, I did some shaving cream prints the one day and she just took off on it. I mean, she just got so engaged on it and that made me realize that she needs a lot of sensory input. So I began doing a lot of things, putting cornmeal and paint, anything so that she could feel things and touch things, uh, using Mr. Sketch markers so they smelled good or uh, sending some things too. So adaptations can eliminate or heighten sensory stimulation using tools like crimpers and surfaces, um, soft bottles. Uh, sometimes I'll put my Elmer or my glue in to um, soft perm bottles you get from like the beauty supply place, um, making surfaces tactile, scenting and putting different things into mediums or using paper mache, adding sand, and then of course, any kind of body movement is also a sensory thing. So I'll show you some examples of how to do different tennis ball painting or marble painting uh, in the next video. Next video, please. Sensory adaptations encourage students to become engaged in the creative process. There's lots of different ways to uh, adapt lessons for sensory input or students with sensory deficits. Uh, sometimes the surface is a nice way to adapt. These are some paints that can go on uh, a little more smoothly, which creates a nice sensory experience. They kind of glide across as opposed to maybe using crayons or a paint and a brush. They're a great way to have the students quickly apply paint and it provide, provides a sensory experience. Alternatively, you can use different shapes and pressing, different types of things to paint with, sponges, Q-tips, uh, cotton balls, anything like that's great to use. You can also provide sensory input by surfaces. This is a textured rubbing plate that makes a pattern. So students could, if they couldn't make their own pattern, they could rub this pattern on top. You could also use things like burlap, old puzzle pieces, packing material, bubble wrap, uh, anything that would create some texture. Here's a few examples of some textured pieces. Uh, not only is it have a sensory experience, but it's also visually appealing, uh, engages all the senses. So um, touching and applying things this way is a great way. You can also have students press things in it's pressing into clay or um, a uh, air drying clay. You can use and scent materials in your classroom. This one's vanilla. Usually vanilla and lavender are the two scents I recommend. And then there's also some sensory experiences of um, involving more of the whole body. So you can put some paint uh, in a dish and dip. This is actually a, a toy and there's some different sized balls that you can roll into paint and put it inside a box that went with a plastic bag and then roll it around. So tennis balls create a nice fuzzy texture. Sponges create a nice fluffy texture. And a lot of times I'll have students make a bunch of different beautiful papers. Here's another one. This one is made by a shaving cream print. So we just put shaving cream and put some food dye on top of it and swirl it with a toothpick. Then students can lay it on and I use a roller to squeegee it off to get a nice print. All those can be combined into making an art project. So it's kind of a two-step project. You can also have them draw on uh, different fabrics. This is just paint that's puffy 
and uh, metallic, and that can be used as a way to create art, or a second project could be making a frittage from that. Creating on any alternative surface, like tin, and then of course doing some of the combing techniques, brushing, pulling a comb through it uh, to create designs as engaging. Of course, building anything that uh, engages the senses, um, like different levels of a uh, relief painting. Or you could do a uh, printmaking plate and then have them do printmaking projects like that. Drawing into styrofoam and making printing. Or you can also make sandpaper prints, uh, have them color on sandpaper, and then heat up an iron and print it that way. I hope you've enjoyed these sensory adaptations. So it's the same kind of for me goes with the sensory adaptation. Sometimes I'll just set up different tables in the classroom and I'll put one big gold copier box with a bag in it and tennis balls and the kids will go around and make a bunch of different papers. And um, I set it up that way so that no one is singled out and it's kind of a fun day for everybody. So um, try some of these suggestions there. Children really enjoy them. Next slide, please. So emotional and behavior adaptations. Uh, you really wanna plan strategies in advance so that you may diffuse an emotional behavior or outbreak. So sometimes I'll have a kind of a code with a person in the office with certain students that if I send them down there with a bin full of paint or, or a bag of clay or a bunch of library books, the librarian, she'll just say, oh, thank you. I'll just put a note on there. And sometimes teachers send me a student down with a pile of books or things so that's giving them a movement break and it's also kind of working those gross motors and calming their body down when they need to take a break so planning that in advance so that way you know you have that strategy in in, in your playbook and all of a sudden when somebody's having a uh, meltdown or really getting stressed in class you can just say hey why don't you take these to the office for me um, provide a safe, compassionate, structured environment. I did have one student where I had to make a little tiny center um, in the corner with a soft carpet and some soft, uh, like a pillow around there so that he could go there when he felt that he needed to. Another thing is having headphones nearby if you need those. Or the last um, one that I would do for a structured environment is I have an easel up in my room and it's kind of like a take five place. I have a little timer there and they can just go over and um, I'll say, you know, if something's really stressing you out, you just need to like feel like screaming go over there and paint, paint it out. And um, they actually use that and a lot of kids like to use it when they finish uh, lessons early as well. So provide uh, relaxing activities for stress relief, whether it's scented paints or whether it's nice music in the background encouraging the heavy work has a calming effect, giving a child a new needed eraser, a stress ball, egg timer, all can be little things you just have around to help uh, when someone's having a bad day. And uh, the other thing you can do is implement a behavior plan with your student's teacher, school psychologist, or counselor. Uh, you don't always know what a child's going through. I've discovered this over the years. Um, sometimes it tells you things in IEPs, but they don't always tell you that. And sometimes students that don't even have IEPs are going through a really stressful time and they just need some way to deal with it just like we do we can go take a yoga class but you know most kids don't but i do do yoga in class a lot of times it's the whole class is too rowdy so that's always a fun thing to try um, they all they all know what namaste means already so that's a good thing can you show the next video please here are a few adaptations for students with emotional behavioral concerns Students with emotional behavior concerns sometimes just need a little positive reinforcement. So um, a lot of times they'll have behavior charts, but it's sometimes better to specialize one for art. So you can um, make up one of these, keep the, I keep the smiley faces and green means go, yellow means you're not doing the best and red means you need to change things. So sometimes I'll keep it at the start of art, the middle of art and the end of art so that the students are given three little short-term objectives to make it. So sometimes they can start out uh, at the beginning of art and they're doing great. In the middle of art, they're not doing so great, but at the end of art, they're doing pretty good. Another one would be to use a um, behavior chart 
uh, that's made up from board maker or sometimes the occupational therapist will give a behavior chart. I like to give them a pen with a uh, squishy adapter on it so that uh, sometimes they like to fidget a little bit. And they would mark it themselves. Did they listen? Were they doing their work? Did they need a break? After their work, did they clean up and did they make proper choices? So behavior charts are a great way to adapt. Um, giving uh, some clay, soft clay for them to kind of de-stress with or a sits cushion or even a kneaded eraser can be helpful. A lot of times I'll put a uh, timer. This is a sand timer. I'll put a timer on the child and kind of try to keep them focused and the uh, actual sand going down is a great way to calm the student down. Having a safe place is another important thing and doing heavy work. So sometimes I'll say, can you pass out scissors or I'll get a big bin of scissors and I'll tell them that to carry it around and, and put some on each table. So that heavy work kind of helps calm them down a bit before they have to do fine motor work like art and tails. Another reason that some students might act out sometimes is because the work's too difficult. So a project like this where they had to make their own tracers and um, draw the shape uh, repeatedly overlapping it might be too much work for them, might be a little too hard for them to understand. So instead of drawing a shape like this, if they could come up with it, they could use a pre-made shape and just trace around that or give them like this part. So they're still doing the activity, they're just having that little lift up that they need to be successful at it. When they're successful at it, I really find there's not as much behavior problems. I hope you've enjoyed these adaptations. So that last um, part where the black and white picture, um, another thing is, you know, this happens all the time where one student might trace that shape or tr that they made 20 times, another might trace it six. So we just kind of have to think, okay, well, are they meeting the objectives of the lesson? Whether they do six or 20, yes, they are. They're learning about black and white. You might want them to fill a bit more of the background up and you have to kind of develop that relationship with the students to know whether you should push them a little bit more or whether they've had enough and that they're just you know going to shut down after that so that's kind of a really important uh, area to think about uh, i had one student who uh, loved using the behavior chart and it would work for him and then sometimes it you know i'd show him the middle and like i said you know you're not doing too good you hit somebody and i'm like what can you do about that and we talked about changing it but one of the uh, most important things for this child was is at the end of class, and he would promise me he'd be good if I would do this, that I had to trick his teacher. So she would come down and she'd say, how was so-and-so's day? And I'd say, he was absolutely fabulous. And then, she, you know, he said, oh, we tricked her, we tricked her. He really, like he really wanted to trick his teacher. So you have to find what works for each student. The same thing does not work for all students. And it might work for them one week and it won't work the next. So you have to kind of be on your toes and constantly um, be upping your game a bit. Next slide, please. So hearing impaired adaptions, some students may have a partial uh, hearing or a total hearing loss. And just because someone, I went through, um, with, we had the um, deaf and hard of hearing at our school for several years before they were moved to a different area and I saw several of the students get the cochlear implants. And some people were like, oh, it's so cool, they can hear now. And they just would assume that they knew everything. But you have to realize that if someone hasn't heard anything and has been deaf from um, early childhood or from the time they were born, and then they get the cochlear implant like in, when they're seven or eight years old, they have missed many years of comprehension. And you just can't think that all of a sudden because they can hear, is that they can really know all of that knowledge that's been lost over those years. So you have to really take it slow with them. So chunking information is really important so they can visually process it. Demonstrating, show rather than tell, use visuals whenever possible. If you can print out a visual or step-by-step -step instructions, put it on each table, that way you're not picking out student particular students. And we all know that there's students who come in late from art, or I mean, late to art, from music or from uh, different classes that they have. They'll come in late from violin lessons to me. So sometimes just having that handout on all the tables can help many students. 
Um, use discretion when using the audio amplification systems that students give you. Some students are fine and comfortable with it. Other ones are a little bit embarrassed by it and you have to be sensitive to that. So uh, one student had asked me, you know, he didn't want to use it, just slid it across the table. And one of the other kids said, well, what's that? Why are you using that? And I said, well, I kind of talk softly and mumble a bit. So this helps him hear me better. And they're like, oh, well, that's cool. So try to uh, make it in, not make a big deal about it. Um, I do always kind of check to see if it is on and if the batteries are charged and everything. Reduce noise as much as possible. Um, close classroom doors. Try to limit the pencil sharpening and the background noise. If you have a signing interpreter, have them stand uh, beside you um, or behind you because I've, when I first started working with students that signed, I would, they would be standing across the table and it was like the child was watching a ping pong match, looking at the interpreter, looking at me, trying to figure out what to do and they would lose a lot of, um, of the visual teaching elements of art by doing that. And always look directly at your students when speaking, um, checking frequently to measure comprehension for lesson objectives. So a lot of times you might have to just come up and tap a child on the shoulder from behind to get their attention. Um, making sure that they're actually looking at you. Don't just go up behind them and start talking because they need to see your face to understand. Next slide, please. So visual impairments um, can be anywhere from uh, vision color deficiencies um, to total blindness. And if you can see at the pictures on the left, the first one is a painting a blue dog. And I'm just gonna move this out of the way for this one. And you can see that it has um, bright colors in it. The one underneath of it is um, when students have protonopia, which is the red-green color deficiency. So if you were doing um, an art criticism and talking about how the artist used yellow and bright green to add some contrast to the work, the students with uh, vision, color vision deficiencies might re really understand what you're talking about. The one at the bottom of this green-blue color blindness is durantopia. So you would, if they were talking about how the artist used red to show um, distance, they would have no clue what you're talking about. A better way would be to say how the artist used the small dogs in repetition uh, through the slide. So that's a better way to describe. So you have to be mindful of that. I had twins that um, came through my uh, art classes a few years back that were both colorblind and they really opened up my eyes for how they said we can see most things but when you get into like um where it's red orange as opposed to orange as opposed to yellow orange they couldn't see any differences at all so if you're teaching color theory it's a little tricky um you want to uh, students with low vision you want to outline or create a tactile surface create three-dimensional artworks that they can feel if they're totally blind, outlining areas with a wide uh, black or blue line for low vision. A lot of my students, um, you'll see them putting their head almost on top of the artwork to try to see. And launch font, font on handouts and signage. And use high contrast, a, a magnifying glass if needed for them, then tell them that they're scientists exploring things. Be aware how color deficiencies impact creating and responding to art. And be aware of low contrast handouts and signage. If in any, doing anything like red and green together, that vibrates enough, um, they can't see that. Uh, red on black, they would see much better. Can you show the next video, please? Adaptations for students with visual impairment will have them more engaged in their art making. For students with visual, impairments it's great for them to use um, brightly colored paper or fluorescent paper it's easier for them to see uh, sometimes i'll even give them uh, brightly fluorescent paint to work with another great adaptation is to use textured surfaces this one's an embossed paper from a scrapbooking section there's another one from that section with texture here's a couple pieces of paper that have bright contrast for patterns. So if they're using patterns, if you were doing something that was like light blue on blue, it wouldn't have as much contrast if you were using something like this. When I'm having them draw something, often I'll give them a, if they need a tracer to use, I'll either give them one that's a little bit thicker or that has a raised glue edge that they can feel. 
You could even use the uh, puffy paint to put around there so it could really feel it. And um, always giving a selection of tracers. So you can see this would have more feeling than flat. And then also using the uh, printmaking foam or foam sheets also helps. In addition to that, you can use these sticks, which are sticky, and um, they kind of hold a shape once pressed. So if you're trying to get them to feel a circle shape, you could press that down on the paper, and then they could help trace around that because they would be able to feel it. So these are uh, a great to use. Same with markers, using things that are nice and bright. And when you're doing any marker work, you want to always, if the student um, has a hard time seeing, sometimes they have to look up close. If you drew a pencil line, you wouldn't be able to see it as well as if you drew a really bold line like that for them to cut on. So those are uh, great ideas for students that have low vision. Another one that you could do would be, actually I tint some of my blue black and you could draw with black glue, creating a raised surface. And then once that dries, you get a really nice raised up bead that the students could feel and follow. And then they can color it in or use it in their artwork. So an example of that would be having a underwater scene outlined in the black and then the students could easily um, come in and fill the paints in afterwards and feeling the texture of it. Sometimes giving students pre-made pieces if they also uh, would have a cognitive deficit is important. You can see here the difference of a light pencil line compared to a thick black outline to cut out. So students would uh, paint with those first and then actually paint on top of it and create a collage from that. A lot of times you do demonstrate, you just uh, kind of talk about the lesson that having a handout uh, for your visual learners or printing it in a larger font is also a good idea. And you can um, have pictures of step-by-step -step processes. And these are a great thing just to put on every table. I never want students to know that I'm adapting lessons uh, or have anyone feel like they're being focused on by me doing adaptation. So sometimes just putting one on every table alleviates that problem and also is a great thing for all students to have because so many times students are coming in late from lessons or they are uh, not really in the mode of listening to you and they don't know what to do afterwards. You can also, this is a um, print by a famous artist and so that the child could actually feel it since they can't see it. Uh, or they have a little trouble seeing it if their vision's low, uh, I will put glue down and then sprinkle sand on top of it and it creates a nice surface. Or you could um, do one with fluorescent paint on top of it. So uh, adding texture to a reproduction is a great way to have them see and feel it. Using bold prints for them to see, nice contrast with it. Or a textured surface. This is a printmaking plate. Again, like I said, high contrast is really important. Thick outlines. And even if you are doing a something like a landscape and the student uh, has a cognitive deficit as well as vision, they might need the areas outlined so that they know which areas to color what colors. And outlining with a thick marker is a lot better than just outlining with a thin pencil giving a lesson like an art rubric at the end for the students to work on. Um, increasing it to a larger font is a great way to adapt the lesson. And of course, creating on bright surfaces. These are those rolling uh, rollers with patterns on them I talked about today, but using fluorescent paint creates a visually exciting piece of work. Here's a still life where they used a black thick outline and bright colors. It's also important when you're talking about art, whether it's a student's artwork or a uh, artistic reproduction of a famous artwork, is to watch how with students with color uh, um, deficiencies might not see it the same way. So you might say, well, how did the artist use red to show that it was watermelon flavored? 
and the student might not be seeing that as red. They might be seeing that as pink or even um, possibly green if they have color vision deficiencies. I hope you've enjoyed these adaptations. Next slide, please. So intellectual deficits um, affect the student's ability to learn um, and to fully engage in the art making process. So you really need to um, learn what they can do. And this is when the beginning of the year, a lot of times, if I have a new student come in or even mid-year if a new student comes in and they have an intellectual deficit, I'll ask if I can work with them one-on-one -on -one for a bit and I'll kind of test them out and I'll see, okay, can they hold a pencil and draw? Or if they can do that, can they cut on a line? Can they um, follow simple one, two or three step instructions? And I just kind of evaluate them so that I know how I need to adapt my lessons. And on my um, weekly chart, I always have like all classes that come. I even take a little highlighter and I highlight them so I know which classes are coming with students with uh, you know special needs that I need to actually have my lessons adapted for. And then I make up those lessons. I put the adaption right in the folder with them. So if it's a fifth grade lesson, it's in the fifth grade drawer and the adaption's right there with the lesson. So I don't have to, sometimes I have to think on the, on the spot and come up with an alternative if it's not working, but you know, I sometimes keep things like tracers right in there so that they're with it and I don't have to go searching when I'm busy with as many students as we all teach each day. Um, the deficits can have a wide range from severe cognition to just attention deficit disorders. Teaching in a concrete step-by-step -step manner using repetition reinforcement and chunking information are sent, uh, essential. A lot of times I'll give them a little checklist that I put next to their spot where they sit and I'll just say, make sure you're checking these boxes. You know, did you, you know, do a preliminary drawing? Did you use uh, background, foreground and middle ground in your picture? And I'll give them a little bit of a list, um, especially students with attention deficit because they can really get off task easily. Model the steps and simplify the process. Uh, and a lot of students with cognitive deficits come in with their paraprofessional. So you really have to develop a great relationship with your paraprofessionals and they can be what we call the gatekeepers to a child actually accessing art. So what I mean by that is that if they're there and they can open the gate and say, all right, I'm going to show you and demonstrate how to do it and follow your steps, the child has to process. If they say, oh, that my kid can't do that. No, that you, are you kidding? They can't do that. They can't do that. We'll just leave now. Then they're closing the gate. And I've had um, a lot of paraprofessionals that are excellent. And then I've also had some that I just have to really say, I'll, I'll, I'll let me demonstrate. I also have some, I'm sure you do, that want to do the kids art project for them. And that's why having them do the same art project right beside the student with special needs is essential because then they can model the steps and then they're also keeping themselves busy and making an art project so they don't do the child's for them. Hand over hand's necessary sometimes, but it's all about choices. Um, you can use tracers, light tables, slant boards. I have a couple of light tables that if the child can't independently draw, they can trace it so at least it's more of their artwork. Offering a variety of tracers is also important and using um, a talker or a, um, board maker, they can see that to the right and they can pick what color they want. If they can't communicate, they can tap on the button and it'll say for them whether they want red or purple for their color. Can you show the next video, please? Students with cognitive impairments will benefit from the following adaptations. Students with cognitive deficits sometimes need a little bit of scaffolding for them to achieve the lesson. And you might even need to scale the lesson back uh, to a grade level younger than they are in order for them to be successful. So you can offer a choice of tracers when making uh, or drawing a still life and uh, let the student choose from them. If they have too much of a problem tracing around the thin ones, you can also give thicker shapes for them to trace around so that they can actually have uh, make choices and create art that way. Again, um, the cognitive deficits, the 
double tracer method of covering up what they've already done and letting them paint on the background is a valuable tool. Tracers come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, sometimes I'll give one like this one creating a body so that they can pose the body the way they want and then use blue tack to hold it down and they can trace it. Uh, they may not be able to independently draw a picture of a body. Also giving uh, concrete examples. If you talk about a skeleton, they may not know the word skeleton, but if you show them a skeleton, let them feel a skeleton, they might know what that is if you were doing something like a Day of the Dead project. I keep bags of tracers um, with my lessons just so it's easy for, the, for me to have with them. Once you make the adaptation up to your lesson, it's there for years to come. So sometimes there are bags with different trees, things in nature. In this case, the students were doing a lesson and the able-bodied peers were working on drawing a castle and understanding shading, and that would be too much to do. So the alternative would be to give some pre-cut shapes that could be used as castle parts. And the student is still building their own castle design and coming up with how they want to arrange them. So they're having their meaning making in art, but you're giving them an aid to hold it. And then again, the blue tack or just really pushing that hand over hand um, and using the helper hand to hold the places uh, pieces in place. When it comes to painting, uh, you might need to go for a little bit bigger brushes if you need to. And when it comes to creating patterns, you can give pre-made patterns. They can make their own patterns by using stickers or foam rollers, or you can even get different stamps with it that they could stamp patterns on with. Um, I've done just about everything and anything to get patterns. Uh, you could use markers to make dots with, or bottles of paint. Uh, you could also, I was trying to think how an easy way to have a student make stripes and I just put a glob of paint at the top of each one and gave them a little piece of foam core and they just dragged the paint down. We were doing a uh, red, white, and blue project. They couldn't make stars, but they could make pom-pom dipped in white and make little white dots in the blue for the project. So that's how I adapted that lesson. Anything that makes it easier for them and that they have a more successful art experience. Uh, a lot of students will come in with a board maker and um, there are ones for arts. You can ask your uh, classroom teachers or life skills or learning support teachers to uh, have the art added on. So it'll ask the students, you know, they can tell if they want to draw, paint, do clay, what colors they want to use. It actually is a very good tool for communication. That said, sometimes you need to simplify things for students with cognitive deficits and actually outline the area so that they don't get confused that they're going to be painting this area green, they're going to be painting this white, and they're going to be painting that yellow. So this is how I would adapt a lesson. Um, this is a famous artist that liked to use primary colors in his artwork, and the students had to actually draw the grid. I gave them the pre-cut pieces, but even this for a student with cognitive deficits might just be too much work and um, too involved. So you can easily adapt the lesson by just giving a black piece of paper and then giving them pre-cut shapes that they can still get the meaning of the lesson using primaries, using black and white, and um, making an art with these geometric forms. Always adding, having let them do something a little more free form is also a successful way to make art. So if all the students were doing circles that they had to fill in all of them with pastel, that would be probably too much for a special needs student. So I would allow them to use some pre-cut ones to glue on. And one final adaptation, um, doing something like painting a very detailed pumpkin with strokes and using pastels for the background might be a little too much, but you can still have the same effect by using, there's a star and moon roller and then using um, the sponge to sponge paint the pumpkins and they still have the same effect of getting a pumpkin patch scene in the evening. I hope you've enjoyed these adaptations. Next slide, please. So if you have questions. Looks like we have just a couple. Um, to go back to your um, talk about building relationships with the paraprofessionals.
Mm -hmm. What do you do if a paraprofessional wants the student to do exactly the same as everyone else without any adaptations? Um, I just have a talk with them and I'll tell them that, you know, the student is not going to find it as enjoyable. And, you know, I've, I've actually had asked paraprofessionals to uh, take a break and I'll, I'll work with the student. I'll, you know, I had one who just told me that the student couldn't do anything. Um, and I, you know, I just had her take a little bit of break and, and then I demonstrated it. But if they want them to do the exact same thing, you just say that, you know, it's, you, you have to remember, and, and they can be intimidating and they can get attitudes, but um, it's your class, you're in charge. So you just have to say, you know, I don't feel that that's in the best interest of the child. I'd like to try a few adaptations. If they can do that, then maybe we can try it your way. But, you know, for right now, we're going to try it this way. And I, you just really have to be firm with them. Uh, it's been a bit of a problem lately in our district. I've had some great paraprofessionals have been there for 15 years, but um, they're kind of grandfathered in. A lot of them are coming from agencies now. And it's really important for children with special needs to have like the same paraprofessional week after week for the whole year. And we're getting a bit of a revolving door since we're using an agency. And sometimes within the course of a year, we'll have four or five different paras just working with that one child. And then that's, you have to each time retrain them to your way of thinking. Um, I have the support of a lot of the other paraprofessionals in the life skills classes and they'll say, no, you should really listen to Bet because she really cares about children. And I think once they find you really care about the child and the child's success, then they're a little more willing to bend and do what you want. Great. That answers your question. Yes. And do you have any tips for folks who are teaching online on how to best adapt for your students through online environments? Yeah, that, that's been a tricky one because I'm teaching all online too right now and I have my two life skills classes. So um, I'm sending out YouTube videos um, to basically um, my, all students. And if they can't do those videos, I'm also sending out to my life skills teachers and to um, some of the learning support, a list of activities. So if we were doing, um, we were doing mandalas the one day where they're going to be painting them, do a lot of intricate design work and folding the paper and change, transferring the graphite from one part to the next. And I, I knew they wouldn't be able to do it. So I just kind of opened it up a little more fun. And I said, you can make it using toys. You can go outside and make mandalas using sticks. I showed them some of Andy Goldworthy's work. And um, anything is circular mandala. So um, sometimes just thinking, all right, they're not gonna be able to do this. How else can they do it? And that's really what you need to think about. I also send some basic skill development things home for my students with special needs so that they could just work on their fine motor skills, um, told them to do some paper tearing, gave them some ideas on how to make something out of tearing paper, how to um, work on drawing within shapes and everything. And um, I sent it through my um, special needs uh, teachers so that, you know, they would actually get it. So I'm kind of getting it, giving it to them from both ends. I'm giving them the regular art lesson. I'm also giving them some adaptations. And you really have to think, okay, what will the parents have at home? So I'm thinking, you know, they might not have colored construction paper. I don't want them to have to run out and buy or something. But do they have old coupons they can, or circulars from magazines? Do they have a catalog that they can rip little pieces of paper out of and make a design with? Um, do they have toys? Do they have buttons or jewel, their mom's jewelry that they can make a mandala out of? So kind of think outside the box. They're like They might not all have paint, but you know we can make art out of anything. We all know that. And we just have to kind of think, OK, how can we make this fun? This is stressful enough right now what we're all going through. We need to just really have the kids do some fun activities. Maybe instead of, you know, you just have them string Cheerios or Fruit Loops onto a piece of, you know, a pipe cleaner or a necklace, and then they get to eat them later. Or maybe they glue down Cheerios. Think about making art with food. So think outside the box. You guys are all so creative. I know, you know, you got this. Great. Um, so some of the tools that you showed, um, for example, the adaptive scissors. Mm -hmm. Do those, when you purchase, does that come out of your art budget or the special needs teacher's budget or a separate budget altogether? 
great question. It depends on how good you are at negotiating. So um, the first time I set up my adaptive art program, um, I went to special ed and I said, you know, I, I really want to work with these students. And he came in and observed me doing some of it. And he, he deemed me the art whisperer. So that was a compliment. And I, he said, all right, you know, I'll give you, what do you think you're going to need? I said, can I have $300? And he said, sure. And um, I've since then added to it. Sometimes I will ask the special needs for it. If I get a no there, I have a very uh, loving principal and a district that supports um, teaching and accessing all learners and, uh, you know, making even playing field. We have equity teams in our building and our district. So equity is really big. So you can always use that word, those catchwords and say, you know, I want to make sure that I'm really working on equity. But to do that, I need a little bit more funding to buy some adaptive scissors, you know, and, you know, I, I do have a department supervisor I went to. Uh, when that failed, because my budget's gone down over the years instead of up, I, I've gone to uh, some fundraisers. I've done some of the art fundraisers, and I told the PTO that they helped me. I would split it with them, and then I use that money to beef up my art program. There's a lot of other really cool stuff out there I'd like to get. This year, I bought a lot more um, steam-based things for them to get down on the floor with and a lot of fun things. So there's ways to do it. Um, I've learned some ways from other people. So if you want to save some of your budget for those tools, this year and last year, I went and uh, each third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, they all put out um, a supply list. And I said, can I add one supply to each class? So in kindergarten, I said, can I have two glue sticks? In first grade, I asked for crayons. In third grade, I asked for watercolor paints, and it went up. And the parents all sent it in. It was no big deal to them, but it left me have some of that money to buy three more easels for my art room. So just be creative with it and um, throw those key words out there. Differentiating instruction, equity, they're all really big, powerful words in education. So don't be afraid to use that angle to get what you need to help the kids. Great. Um, we have a, one person that would like to know a little bit about um, your teaching situation, how long your classes are, what are the grades that you teach, and how often do you see them? All right, so I teach K to five. I'm an elementary teacher. I used to teach art camps in the summer, but um, I've since stopped teaching that. I taught high school kids in the summer. I've been teaching um, for about 20 years, over 20 years now. I see my students um, on a four day cycle. So every four days, the classes come in. When I first started teaching, I had less students um, because our population was smaller. And I gave up one of my planning periods to teach adaptive art. And that was when I really work, found how to um, work with students with special needs. I'll never forget like my first week teaching I thought, okay, they've taught me all this stuff in college. I went in there to teach, and I had um, five students from a life skills class in a room, several emotional support, and uh, the, the paraprofessionals came into the room, dropped them off, and said, see ya. And it was like chaos. I was running around trying to help these core students who didn't even know how to hold a pencil. Other kids who were gifted wanted more stuff, and I'm trying to teach them, and I thought, this isn't good. I can't get everybody, something has to change. So I went right down to the life skills classrooms and I said, the aides that come with your class, you know, that teach in your classroom, why don't they come to art? Oh, you want them to come to art? And I said, yes, I want them to stay the whole time. So, um, you know, and anytime someone's not showing up for art, I just get right on it to, the, I call right to the teachers. I'm like, you know, it's art right now and two of your students aren't here why aren't they here? Oh, well, you know, they were a little tired of taking a nap. And I said, well, when they're up from their nap, can you bring them down? So I've um, changed my situation over the years because now I'm in two schools and I teach over like 580 kids a week. So I don't have any planning time anymore with my schedule. Uh, we do every four days. So now it's all inclusion. But um, I still find that, you know, the paraprofessionals come in and stay the whole class. And um, that's, I've trained them from the beginning. And uh, that's really the way I handle my teaching situation. It looks like we have a few teachers who are a little overwhelmed with either multiple paraprofessionals in the same space and also 
trying to craft lessons that meet the whole variety of needs. And I know you touched on this um, in a lot of your presentations where you were highlighting you know, um, fine motor, but also cognitive. But do you have any tips for, I guess, how to not get overwhelmed with the amount of adaptations you may need to make for um, multiple students with more severe disabilities? in one class period. Yeah, sure. Um, so it, you do get overwhelmed by paraprofessionals and um, sometimes you feel like it's not your class. Well, one of the things that bothers me the most is when they start talking to each other, pulling their phones out during class. And uh, at first I was like, I went and talked to the teacher and I said, you know, your, your paraprofessionals are like talking to each other when I'm, you know, and they're like, okay, we'll say something. And I don't think they always do. So. I've just grown in confidence over the years and I think that's what some of it is. Um, I'm in this for the kids and I'm not gonna let anybody take that away from them. So I've gotten, you know, some of them I'm sure may not like me, but I've, I've earned their respect. So sometimes you have to earn the respect. And I've just said, you know, you know, like I'll, I'll clap my hands three times. I'm like, okay, three, two, one, let, you know, and everybody else stops talking, but they don't. And the kids all look at them and I'm like, I said, can everyone be quiet, please? You know, and I just, they're like, oh, you know, they look at me, but if you're rude enough to talk while I'm demonstrating, then I'm going to be rude enough to say, stop talking, please. Okay. Because, you know, I, I, like I said, I'm in this for the kids. As far as the adaptations, um, it took me a while. So don't beat yourselves up. It took me a while to get like all of these adaptations going. I started making the fine motor bins that I keep in little plastic shoe boxes and I just stick on the table. Um, I, I have a whole section in my room where I just have bins that say, you know, cognitive adaptations and I'll pull the bin out of my closet. I'll have a little bin full of all the brushes. But as the years have gone on and I've taught this way, the paraprofessionals know where everything is in my classroom. They're like, can I get the adaptive scissor bin out? I'm like, sure. So they've also, I got them to buy into it. And that's what's really important. When they see the joy on a face, I'll never forget one paraprofessional who just said, you know, are you kidding me? She can't do that. She throws everything, you know, and I taped a piece of paper down. Sometimes I'll tape the whole paper down. She, this little kid likes tearing stuff up. And I dumped a bunch of uh, finger paint out. And I said, go ahead, back up. I don't care if I get paint on me because some of them all even joked. And we said, you're going to wear white, you know, when you come into art class, you know, not, not a good choice, guys. So now I get so many freebie aprons from different places I go that I've got a whole bunch of aprons that they can put on. So there's no excuses anymore. And uh, I just let the kid go with the paint. And she was just, she yeah, actually put it in her ears. And, you know, but that kid went home and the parents knew she painted it herself. It wasn't like that somebody else painted it. You know, sometimes I think it's an insult to the parents to send home this perfectly made piece of artwork that they know their child didn't do. Right. You know, so be authentic. And when you're, you know, if you have a child with fine motor, then you might have to hurry up and work in a fine motor thing by just giving them a different type of paintbrush to hold. Mm -hmm. If they have um, cognitive deficits, I pull out the different things that I can do to isolate it so they kind of keep it. Even the, the paraprofessionals now know they're like, okay, they'll cover up an area so that they don't scribble over that area. And they'll guide them. And once you get a really good relationship with your paras, and their respect, I even, gave, I even gave them all articles one time to read, you know, about the importance of their job. They wanna feel important. A lot of them think it's their kid. They get very attached to it. But what you have to realize is you're seeing them one, maybe two times a week for 45 minutes, you know, and that's only twice a month. Once a month, I see them two times a week. Mm -hmm. Where the pairs are with them all day long. If they're in life skills, they're with them all day long and they're parents. So, the community that you have around you can, if you get them to buy into your plan, can really support you. So don't think you have to do it all alone. Ask the occupational therapist. I had this one kid, I found out he was going to, you know, to a OT all the time. And I said, you know, he says, oh, I'm late for art because I have to work, you know, OT. And I said, well, what did you do? And he was like coloring. And I said, to the OT, I said, can you come into art and work with him? Because that's where he really needs it. That's where all the fine motor is. So ask them to come into your class. I hope that answers some of that. But, you know, it's, it's, it does take some time to get all your resources together. Great. Can we advance to the next slide? 
I want to make sure that everyone knows that there is lots more amazing information from Beth in um, her new book just out, um, Adaptive Art Deconstructing Disability in the Art Classroom. And we would love to give away a free copy. So all you need to do is to um, share your success story, your adaptation success story by May 15th at 5 p.m. That's Eastern time and tag Davis Publications on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. And we will be pulling a winner from those. And we know that you've all got some success, big or small, because we're all trying um, to meet the needs of all of our students. So please share those great tips with us. And um, if you could go to the next slide. We also have um, lots of free resources available at davisart.com slash free resources. You can sign up for weekly webinars. You can access the Davis digital platform, access professional development sessions, School Arts Magazine online, and view some of our on-demand on video lessons. We've also got lots of really great weekly webinars coming up. Um, next week, we will have a panel on fashion, how to teach fashion. They'll be discussing how to use traditional and non-traditional materials, how to design for various body types, and they will be sharing their favorite lessons. Later in the series, we'll hear from experts on photography, mindfulness, making murals, and engaging with contemporary art at the elementary level. So please head over to davisart.com slash free resources to sign up. And I also wanted to take a minute to mention our new exhibition opportunity. It's just added. School Arts Magazine and the Frank Juarez Gallery are hosting an art exhibit um, for teachers called Pushing the Envelope, a Mail Art Gallery Show. All you have to do is create a small piece of artwork, one that can be mailed in a standard four by six inch envelope and send it via the U United States Postal Service to Frank Juarez by July 24th. So you've got plenty of time to make lots of little things for this exhibit. The works will be featured in online exhibitions. A selection will be featured in the November issue of School Arts Magazine and the collection will be shown at the NHS Artifacts Gallery at Sheboygan North High School in Wisconsin. We hope that you will consider making something fun for this exhibit. I want to give a special thanks to um, Bet Not In today for sharing all of this wonderful information with us. We really appreciate you taking the time to create such a great resource. Um, and thanks to everyone who joined us this afternoon. We hope that you have found um, the session useful and fun for your Tuesday afternoon. Um, we're going to stop the recording at this point, but we'll stay on for a few minutes longer to answer any burning questions you may have. And we hope that you all stay safe and healthy and that you come back and see more weekly webinars with us soon.